Welcome to Inside the Director's Circle. I'm Jason Langford-Brown, your host, founder of the Director's Circle, practicing business advisor and coaching psychologist. In the last episode, we discussed the blueprint of scaling a business and the challenges of it strategically. So listen back to that for more context on this episode, when we are now going to explore how to implement a strategy for scale at a more practical level. To add a practical element to the discussions, we have three of our business leader members from the Director's Circle. Firstly, Ben Toe, Group CEO of Hadley Group, a global leader in steel, role-forming products and steel construction solutions. Kevin Watson, Managing Director of Amadeus, one of the UK's leading catering and hospitality outsourcers, a part of the NEC Group of Companies. And Richard Price, Managing Director of TIT, one of the UK's leading software suppliers to the utility industry. And just very quickly, before we get into the discussion, remember this is just a snapshot of what happens within our business leader community. So if you want to get more involved or get some deeper insights, visit directors-circle.com and click the join the community button. So what I wanted to do today, guys, is um, talk a bit more practically about actually implementing a strategy for scale. So we talked in the last episode a lot about, you know, the importance of strategy within within the, the scaling context um, and some of the challenges of that. Um, but, you know, once we've now got our strategy, how do we implement it successfully? So I thought maybe start with this in terms of, for you, let's talk about where we got it wrong. So what were the top three mistakes you think you may have made over the years in actually implementing a strategy successfully for scale? Ben, do you want to kick us off on that one? I think my probably one of my biggest mistakes was thinking I could move a business. So okay. I actually bought a business and it was in Wolverhampton. Uh, very good workforce, loyal workforce. Many of them being their uh, man and boy, so to speak. Uh, and actually, we then had a factory. There was a great opportunity to, to realize some synergies. And, and obviously, that's code for cut costs. And so we wanted to move that from you know from Wolverhampton down to uh, Smethwick, uh, and that's broadly a 20, 25 minute car journey. And I think I'm right in saying we managed to retain less than 10% of the workforce. Everybody just went somewhere else. Uh, and I, I had, you know, the, the mistake there was, I just didn't realize that, and, and this, this may or may not be uh, appropriate to your industry but if you change someone's bus route if you know if it's going to take another 10 minutes in the car there are lots of people in this world that don't don't they, you know whether they choose to embrace you as a person or your leadership it's got nothing to do with that they, they're quite simply looking at the cost and what it does for them and you know i i believe that people would see the bigger picture and buy into it uh and I have to say that was an epic fail. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, the, the business is, is very much still there. We've rebuilt it, but uh, you know, to be clear, that mistake probably cost me three years and an awful lot of, lot of blood, sweat, and tears. Yeah, a key key to actually understanding the people that work for you and taking them with you. Yeah, I'm sure we'll come back to that with Kevin's with Kevin's business in a second. But uh, yeah, a couple more just to. Uh... Really test your mind. Oh, okay. Uh, it's it's lovely getting this out in public. I have to say, <laughs> I went into a market which I didn't fully understand. I, I thought I did, and I, I didn't. Uh, and it soon became really quite clear that uh, for me that was very much the construction market. And uh, I, I came to understand that the construction world sees manufacturing. And very differently um, to how well manufacturers are very different in their mindset to yeah. to, con- to contractors, um, and so you know the, the manufacturer almost has a mindset of well the first one ten whatever it is that you're selling will probably cost me money, but what I want is that great customer relationship. I want them to come back. I want them to grow their volumes with me, and that's very much the mindset. It's an expansionist mindset. Whereas yeah. the, you know, the, the construction contractor is on this job, like there's nothing else in the world, there's just this job. And yeah. so I am not carrying any of this. In fact, if, even if I blatantly did make the mistake, if I can pass that off as someone else's, then I, I, it's just a fast, first past the post job. And mm. understanding that although we supply 
products into the construction industry for years as a manufacturer to be then stood on the other side of the fence I, I, I really did that that was a you know hands up fail on my part to to really understand what I was getting into up front yeah that's two two great insights Ben so I let you off the hook there so uh, Kevin <laughs> what about for you what, <laughs> what would you say your top three mistakes have been in uh, implementing um, strategy once you have it developed two drivers to this one point is about um the been able to articulate it and communicate it so your team, however wide, um, can really understand what the goal and why you're doing why you're doing it and the reason you're doing it and also their role they play in it. So it, it sort of ties into the, the, the first sort of um, conversation we had about just keep it simple. And um, I think the golden rule there is if a seven-year-old can't understand it, then you, you've overcomplicated it. So uh, I've been guilty of either overcomplicating or changing too often in the past where I, people haven't kept okay. up with, either have either not kept up with me or just it's got overcomplicated or it's changed too many times and they've just sort of not come on that journey. They don't really understand the journey. They don't understand the end point. They're not on the bus with you. So, 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 so that's probably the biggest fail I've had driven by two different reasons. And then the other one is just not implementing it quick enough. I, I've sat, we've pondered, we've I've sat in several strategy meetings which weren't strategy meetings at all, um, and I've wasted time. And um, I, I, it frustrates me. I'm fairly an impatient individual, and with hindsight, I could have I could have actioned and got on and communicated in varying businesses a lot quicker. So they're they're probably the three things that I've not done so well in the past. Yeah. And just just touching on that uh, that overcomplication piece, um, I, I think that probably is the biggest frustration for leaders, and it probably touches back on what Ben was talking about in terms of moving people from a factory. Because you know we're at we're at a level, aren't we? Here as leaders, um, how 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 have you coped with that frustration of you know your mind's working at a million miles an hour, and you've kind of got that you know that mental agility capability to kind of get it, understand it, know what to do. But of course, it, you're right. Unless you can take the people with you. Uh, and they may not be at that level. So have you dealt with that frustration over the years? Well, I suppose my favourite story, and I don't know whether it's one of those urban myths, but it's about when um, somebody quite senior from NASA went back to the um, wherever the rocket was being launched from, and they came in late on a Saturday evening. They'd left something in the office, and they, they came across the cleaner mopping the floor, and they said, Hello, Bert. What, 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 are you, what are you doing here at this time? And he just turned around and said, we're, "We're putting a man on the moon." And it's just resonated with me all the time. How can I keep it that simple? How can every single member of my team, um, you know, in Amadeus, we're probably up to about maybe two and a half, three thousand individuals. How can every one of those members of the team, in in five seconds, explain what it is they're doing and why they're doing it? And um, that's a constant frustration. It's a constant discipline. And, you know, I, I say, I, I use the analogy of a seven-year-old if they don't understand it. it. You've got to work really, really hard to ensure that every single member of that team understands their role and how they're helping to achieve that overall goal and how important it is. So in my business, whether it's, yeah. say, some somebody sweeping the floor, somebody on, on, on a till, somebody, a kitchen porter putting something away, someone just placing an order, someone producing the product, you know, whatever it is, it's absolutely key. They do their role um, and they do it as best as their ability. And, um, you know, with with allergens, with certain legislations now, with certain laws that are coming through, it, it just gets more and more important, not only in delivery, but also, you know, that for that that sense of direction, that sense of purpose, that sense of being part of a team, and and knowing your own worth and knowing your own your own input. So, you know, when you shout about success and you recognise and reward success, you know, those individuals understand the part they've played, and 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 it's that pride envy dynamic sometimes. You know, I I, I as a as a sort of bit of a soft measure, you know, you get, you try and test the pride within your team within your business. And also the envy outside, you know, how many people are queuing up to come and work with or for you and vice versa, you know, how many people are leaving you to go and work somewhere else. So 
it, it's those sort of soft metrics and there's there's more than you know there's a few of them but it's just keeping that keeping that sense of clarity that sense of purpose my job is to communicate my job is to set the trajectory from my market from my customer ensuring all of my people and all of my team understand where where we're going why we're going in that direction and what their role is yeah, that's, that's a, I think it's really powerful stuff in there, Kevin. I think the, it's the wise, you know, people obviously do need to earn, you know, a certain amount of money, but ultimately people will be on that, will work for a purpose. I think it's interesting just re- reflect on what you just said. I'm thinking, you know, if you if we can get people to be really clear about, you know, the mission or the purpose, whatever language you prefer, um, they probably don't need to know too much else about the strategy other than what their role in it in it is which does simplify it right down doesn't it which is which is which is which is really interesting that's why i love that janitor quote that janitor quote it's so black yeah. and white and straight to it you know we're putting a man on a moon and you know if his floor isn't clean yeah. and, and dry for the following morning that job may the floor's clean yeah that may well take them off mission and it, it, it's it's so simple yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, Richard, for you, what what uh, what do you think your top three mistakes have been in implementing strategy? Uh, the first one that came to mind was employing the right people, um, which sounds a bit um, potentially harsh, but um, I, because most of the employees that we've we've employed at both businesses have been fantastic in in their own rights, but I think it's more so the level of person that we've uh, employed. I think we were. Uh, and I think in hindsight, uh, in both businesses, I think it's a case of employing the best possible person that you can possibly afford. Um, um, and I think yeah. what we've probably done is kind of look at the constraints of um, of of cash and uh, and that side of things and probably made decisions to get the best possible person that we can afford for a certain budget. And we've set that budget too low rather than really, really stretching ourselves, um, which has then meant... Um, you as a leader are relatively lonely um you're you're kind of you've got a lot of doers but you haven't got um other people challenging that uh those decisions and and just because they're not that quite quite at that right level so i think that was the first one that came to mind i think the second one um is um working towards short-term goals so um private equity backed um certainly in 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 the previous business and um obviously working towards a cycle um and it's very much growth at all costs to a certain extent to hit that kind of shareholder objective um and um i think that forces you to um bring in your strategy timeline to um and make decisions that you potentially no aren't the very best for the long term of the business um and you're kind of caught in this kind of uh conundrum if you like where it's right for the existing shareholders but is it right for the um uh um, long-term good of the business and you end up making the wrong decision based off off the back of that and i think that was a a common thing um and then the the last thing i've kind of noted down is paying too much attention to competitors um a competitor will launch a nice snazzy product and where, then we're there um, fretting around having, having a meeting about um, should we be doing something similar? Should we be catching up? Blah, rather than actually um, ignoring the competitors and looking at the, 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 the customers, the market, our own employees, because we've got just as good our ideas and implementing something completely different. We started playing catch up rather than leading the way effectively. Yeah. They resonate with me, with me, Rich. And I, I think, you know, the competitor one is one we talk about a lot. I think people do obsess about it. I, mean, it's, I think you should be aware of your competitors, undoubtedly. I think if you want to, if you want a bit of a shake your thinking, get the Simon Sinek uh, video that, that was out, I think, a year or two ago about his uh, difference between a Microsoft conference and an Apple conference, where Microsoft conference, all they did was talk about Apple and at Apple conference, all they did was talk about their customers was probably <laughs> the, way to, the way to pick up on that. I love your point now, because you you're right. And it's interesting to have a Ben in the room today as well about that difference between being private, private, privately equity backed, and Ben still still is a privately owned business, and I think you're absolutely right. Strategically, I see lots of P backed businesses making bad strategic decisions because it's a short term gain, and I think that for people listening here today, that's probably an interesting reflection point. Ben touched on it about sometimes strategically, you need to we need to prune the bush for the longer term growth of the organisation. It's not I haven't I'm yet to see a P company that's ever taken that approach, Kevin. I don't know if you've got a view on that because you're you've been in that in those weeds recently as well. Yeah, I mean, you know, the the clarity and the sense of purpose of PE gets, gives you is excellent for some sort of personalities and characters and what you want out of a role. 
And then, you know, the other side of it is that longer term, more more steady, more patient investment and a longer term view. And, you know, having done a few of both, you start to figure out what best suits you and where, where you're best suited. Yeah. So it's more about what, where, what the environment that's right for you as an individual. Because you're not going to change that, are you? Don't, you're not going to change that system. No, however hard you fight, it, okay. it's still going to continue <laughs> that model. And um, it, it's whether you survive and, and flourish or you struggle and bump your gums about it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Great stuff. So just, just to wrap up today's conversation on implementation, for, for us, we talk about um, strategy, particularly when we get to implementation being a process. So, and I think for us, the process very much is, you know, there is a, obviously part of the the piece that needs you know you need to develop strategy and but i think there's a piece even before that where you need to make sure that stakeholders are fully engaged in that process once 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 it's formed i suppose at what i would call our board level our owner level our senior level um i think there is a process that on how you then both align the business but also hand it over to the business for them to then take on and execute so i see too many leaders trying to sort of own strategy from start to finish when really it needs to be passed over to the people that are going to execute on it in, in the field and i think then there's part for us the, the, the final part of the process is that some kind of you two talked about cycles rich about the cycle of kind of resetting and refining as you go and kevin and i had a bit of a conversation offline about you know for me it's a bit of a recipe we never kind of get it perfect so there's always a need to kind of refine the recipe uh, as we as we move down the journey so i think probably just to finish off today it'd be good just to on a more positive note maybe just one thing that you think's really worked for you practically in whatever your implementation process is for for strategy Rich, what would you say for you is your kind of one thing you think you, you when you've done it, it's really, really worked well for you? Yeah, I think it's um, testing the market. So um, particularly in the business that we're in at the moment, kind of um, getting that minimum viable product out there to see if there's um, real traction, real demand for it, and then um, putting your eggs in the basket where there is real demand. Uh, I think you can spend ages and ages um, prophesizing and um, guessing what the market will want, whereas there's no better test than actually releasing something that's probably a little bit more simplistic than you want to and that you've got in your head, but there's no better feedback than people actually using something and and telling you what's great about it and telling you what's crap about it. Um, So that's the key thing. It's a bit of minimal, minimum viable product kind of thinking there going on. Thanks, Rich. Kevin, for you, one thing that's really worked for you in implementing strategy? Do you know, I'm, I'm going to be nothing but consistent. Just keep it simple. <laughs> so the simpler yeah. it is, the easier it is to articulate, the simpler it is to understand, um, the easier it is to implement. Great stuff. Thanks, Thanks Kevin. Ben, final word for you today? Uh, I think the, the key word to me would be adaptation um, on the basis that, look, you you know, clearly you we're starting from the point of view of how you scale up. So you've, you've done the startup, you've got what you've got, and you've got the people that you've got. And so constantly, to me, there's a, there's a real rigor in going back to ask the question of, well, how, how, do I, um, how do I augment this? You know, how do we change this for the better? What's in our way? You know, because just by, by way of example, you know, you, it's, it's often that you have a really good person and then the business has grown. And so they just can't necessarily keep up because the volume of work is is huge. But if you put somebody next to them, they don't like that very much. If you make somebody work for them, are they a good manager or are they good at their job? So that constant adaptation, and, and I chose that word carefully because if you just keep redrawing it, we discussed this uh, previously, you know, if you, you, you can have too much change. Whereas if, if you're actually consistent with your message there are times things happen we live in a you know volatile uncertain complex and ambiguous world so you know given all of that it it, you can't just rip the rule book up and change it but you can adapt you can start to put more emphasis on one area and shift it toward another to try and provide that continuity for those that need the continuity and there are you know we're all different personalities um, but that, that's why I said adaptation, you know, you, you can't tear it up, but you, you can start to, to move that to make, make sure that you are constantly reflecting the, the changes in, in market realities, customers' reality, whatever it is in your reality. 
Yeah, absolutely. We are, we're definitely in a, in a, in a very fast moving world. So I think that, you know, that long term view with that short term uh, agility has definitely come through these last couple of podcasts, guys. So I really appreciate that. I think just for me, Ben, just to finish off on that, and there are a couple of things that resonate. I think one of the things, you know, you do touch on there is, you know, what's going to stop us. I see lots of people talking about what we need to do to achieve our strategy, but I think you're right. A check, a check and balance on what's going to stop us is a really important part of the, of the planning process. Um, uh, and you, your 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 points there about you know the change in demands on our people as we grow. Um, I think again emotionally, one of the toughest things I think in scale up is accepting that some people that have been a really important part of getting us to where we are now actually may not be what we need to move us forward. Which I think is a, another probably good point to to finish on today in terms of scaling up. Guys, thank you, thank you as ever. Again, we know we could talk about this um, for hours, but. Um, for, for now, thank you to all of our guests. So thanks again to Ben, Rich and Kevin for joining us today. Some great insights that I'm sure um, we'll take something from. In our next episode, we're going to talk about change. So join us for that in, in a few weeks' time. But in the meantime, if you want more info on this subject, contact directors-circle.com or one of our knowledge partners, lucid-group.com. I'm sure we'll be able to help you and go deeper on the subject. In the meantime, thank you for listening to Inside the Director's Circle.